and welcome and good morning to you pre-morning live glad you are here we've got to go through the biggest scandal ever in government data well almost government data is usually a lot of bollocks but this is a particular the horrific example of the government fabricating facts and it's going to affect you and your portfolio and you need to understand what this means so you can make better decisions now and throughout 2024. So let me walk you through it, a little bit of old banker insight and perspective. But before we do, I want you to do one thing for yourself and that's put your... And by that, I mean learning what are actually the great companies out there. And I've just put out a complete benchmark of every NASDAQ stock out there, and it's completely free, so you can download it. And let me show you how to use it. Go to felixfranzorg slash NASDAQ, download it. There's even a QR code on the screen. You know, we're moving with the times and me and, and the, the cats. And what you can do is there are filters up here. So these little tabs you can click. So gross profit margins are pretty important. So you can say filter by condition and then say greater than 60% maybe. If that's what you're after. Put the percent in, otherwise it won't work. Six, six, zero percent if that's what you're looking for. And then that will, in theory, work. Let's try that one more time. Greater than six, zero percent. Oh, I think I put it in the wrong tab. There it is. Okay. And now you've narrowed this down to only 45 companies, right? So you've got 45 companies that have very good margins. Very good gross margins mean generally a big moat. The second thing you might want to look at is long-term earnings growth. Because the NASDAQ are sort of really growth companies, but they're certainly tech companies. You can do a filter here by, you know, whatever you want it to be, 10, 12% plus. You can also look at PE ratios compared to forward-looking PE ratios. You want the future PE to be less, significantly less than the current PE. You also have good stuff like income margins, again, tells you what is and isn't a good business at present. So play around with this and you will be surprised at some. You will find some interesting businesses you might want to dig into deeper. And that's ultimately what drives your long-term future financial wealth. Not today, not this week, because no one cares in the short term about margins and things like that. But in the long run, that's actually what makes you money. So I want you to get your pulse on that, Felix Rensenhoek slash Nasdaq, and maybe, you know, spend a few hours on the weekend with it. <laughs> Seriously, it's so worth it. You just get amazed by what industries are good and what are bad and so on. So check it out. Now, let's then look at uh, sort of scandal on kind of, you know, Nixon scale here. Absolutely ridiculous. I mean, absolutely ridiculous. So the government has just put out, and this is not a political statement. Previous presidents have done the same thing, left and right of the aisle or identifying to be on one side of the aisle or the other, or, you know, who knows. Uh, initial jobless claims came in at 217,000. And that's basically flat, right? So they're just saying, no, nobody is getting unemployed. The continuing jobless claims are also completely flat month over month. And then we've got something actually possibly genuinely positive here, which is that labor costs are rising less than expected. That's deflationary, disinflationary, however you want to abuse that word. And that's kind of weird because... Let me show you one thing. I'll show you this first. You had some of these people who've sacked people. Bumble, Romba, 30%. Farfetch, 25%. Hasbro, 20%. Finder, 70%. Spotify, 17%. Levi's, 17, 15%. Xerox, 15%. Duolingo, 10%. Rivian, Washington Post, Snap, eBay. You get the idea, right? Paper. These are all just this year, 2024. DocuSign, Charles Schwab, 
Mozilla, Cisco, BlackRock, Nike, UPS, Citigroup, 20,000, ThyssenKrupp, 5,000, Best Buy, 3,000, right? Northrop Grumman. I mean, even the, the defense contractors are laying people off and we've got more wars going on than ever. 1,000 Pixar and so on. 1,300, at least 1,300 that now no longer identify as working for Pixar. And that together with, well, here is the official data, right? So you can get an idea. The jobless claims in green, seasonally adjusted. That's what they do. Seasonally manipulated. So seasonally adjusted is green. And they're apparently just really low and flat, even below 2023 averages, right? Now, let me show you this. In the United States, there is a law called the Worker Adjustment and Retraining Notification Act. Glorious read and delightful thing if you suffer from insomnia. Basically, what it says, if you're going to close a plant, you've got to give workers 60 days notice. How many of those have been sent out of late? Well, in February so far, 26,000. And that's quite a lot. And we've had quite a lot towards the end of, of, of 2023 as well. But the jobless claims of this line down here, that's apparently the real truth, jobless claims. And the fact that all of these factories are closing has apparently had zero impact on unemployment. Zero, none. And it might have nothing to do with the fact that there is an election going on this year. So, no, this is just completely made up completely made up data. The government is just lying through its teeth. And I think what they're probably going to start to do is they might start to seasonally adjust the WARN notices, the Worker Adjustment and Retrainment Notifications, uh, which is the acronym for it. They're called WARN notices, if you haven't seen one of those before. Uh, so that's probably what they're going to do next, because obviously the, the gap here is just so big, it's kind of really hard to explain. And it just means this data is nonsense. And you think, okay, Felix, you're a bit extreme. Let me show you what the Fed says about jobs data. Here it is. Last Fed report. While the recent trends prior to the meeting have been remarkably positive about the job market, Fed officials, which are Fed presidents, judged that some of the recent improvements reflected idiosyncratic movements in a few series, as in they made that shit up. That's how the Fed describes it. So the Fed doesn't believe jobs data anymore either. Wall Street doesn't. And I don't want you to be the last one standing who still do because it's misleading. And why is it important? Because in theory, Microsoft's confiscated my pen. Here we go. In theory, what happens is also stolen my ink. See how I'm blaming everybody? That's apparently the way to get ahead. <laughs> in theory, higher, higher joblessness, joblessness, which is unemployment. It's a funny word for it, I know. Does what? It leads to lower interest rates because the Fed cuts interest rates because they have a mandate to keep inflation low and, and employment high. A bit of a Freudian slip there. And if you manipulate joblessness, like the lot, job, lot, lot, you know, nest monster, then by saying unemployment is artificially low, you actually keep interest rates high, and higher interest rates are bad for you and me in the stock market. We would like interest rates to fall. It would make somebody like a SoFi worth a lot more or any growth stock you might be in worth a lot more. So this is actually something that truly genuinely matters. But it also means, in my opinion, that come November, for some miraculous reason after November, if there is a change in the White House incumbent, if the orange one moves in, I'm going to have to get a yellow pen for that. What will happen then is that in December, you're going to get a massive increase in unemployment because they're going to want to blame it on Biden. So there is a chance that at the end of this year, economic data just sort of explodes, implodes, and 
therefore you're going to get more rate cuts and people are going to feel quite glum and you might get some earnings revisions downs, especially in the kind of retail sector stuff that's more affected by sentiment. So the government is trying to keep sentiment artificially high by basically lying to you. And I think it's something you need to understand. So smash the like button for a little bit of manipulation. Um, it's happening at the very top. Does that mean the party has to end now? Does that mean the market is going to collapse any time now? No. And I'll tell you why. This chart was made by somebody who liked the color green and they thought, I'm going to put two lines in. I make it really clear by using green and green. So a little hard to tell them apart, but we'll use a green pen, shall we? Just to honor the idiot who made this. So the dark green is the S&P 500. And then the light green, do we have a light green? I'm not sure we do. Yeah, we have a weird looking green. The weird looking green is margin debt. So it's basically what the Reddit degenerates do to buy AMC stock and, and, and all that sort of thing. Are you kidding? But margin debt is here. That's margin debt. And in 2021, it was up there. So it can go a lot higher. That's basically the point. Markets only top out once margin debt is super, super high. And you can see that in 1999. You can see that in 2008. You can see that in 2019. So we've got some way to go because the degenerates can still borrow and therefore buy more shares, which is a terrible idea, by the way. Never, ever use margin to buy stocks. Ever. There is no excuse for it. There's no reason to do it. It's just idiotic. Because the one thing you want to be able to do when the market tanks, which inevitably it will, it always does, and then it goes back up again. If you are highly in margin debt here, the stock market goes down, you are selling you are selling down there, the market then recovers and you haven't got any money to get back into it. Whereas if you didn't have any margin debt, you can just hold through the fucking dip and buy some more shares and therefore come out smiling a winner way wealthier. We should enjoy a downwards correction because it's the thing that makes you wealthy. Rallies don't make you wealthy. It's the downward correction if you use them right that makes you wealthy. But I don't think the dip's coming yet. Because partially, because we've got this much money, we've got $9 trillion in money markets, sort of bonds, essentially. Not quite bonds, but, you know, funds that hold bonds. And another $7 trillion in bonds. And there's probably about 2 or $3 trillion of that, which could flow back into the U.S. stock market when interest rates come down, if they come down. Well, they'll come down at some point, but you get the idea. Uh, right. Like all your, your comments. Put your questions in the chat, guys, after you've destroyed and abused the like button. And a um, little bit more good news as well. I thought today could be a cheerful day, right? I think today is a cheerful day. Goldman Sachs, the bankers with a warm heart, are, are saying that this year, Companies are going to buy back BB $925 billion of their own shares, which is a 13% growth over last year. And in 2025, the men with the crystal balls are saying it's going to be another 16% growth on that which means over a trillion dollars of shares will be bought back, which means what? Well, it's much harder for the stock market to go down because they're buying their own shares, right? You know, the Microsofts and the Metas and all the guys who are printing so much money that they don't know what to do with it. PayPal, for example, they're buying back a lot of their own shares and that's supportive. That's good. Good for you and me, which is just lovely. And the other reason we are not collapsing anytime soon is fear. Volatility is super, super low. What does that also mean? It means you should be doing one thing. 
or financial advice, but you might want to consider to do one thing. That would be the better phrasing. Hedging. And you might think, what's hedging? It's not the green thing that grows at the end of your drive. It's insurance against a crash. And at the moment, you can get insurance very, very cheaply because it's related to this fear indicator. How do you do that? You do the following. Search. Actually, the easiest thing to do, honestly, go into our Facebook group. I've got a video in there. I teach you hedging for free. Uh, you go to, let me type it because my handwriting is atrocious. Go to goatacademy.org slash Facebook group. And you might be allergic to Zuckerberg and all of that. I hear all the protests. Yes, but everybody still uses Facebook. It's going to continue. I'll put it in the chat as well. Uh, can I? Am I allowed? Apparently not. Let me see if I can paste. Why can't I paste into the chat? So weird. There it is. Go to academy.org slash Facebook group. So yeah, if you go over there, there's a literally in the, there are lots of lessons in there about how to get started with trading and setting up accounts and brokerages and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, 6,000 people over there as well who are lovely. But there's also a lesson on how to actually insure your portfolio against a crash. And it's a, it's a good thing to understand. Everybody should understand that. I've just lost all my notes, lost my marble. So do that. Check that out. Uh, also make sure you get your pause on our NASDAQ benchmark. Every one of the top 100 NASDAQ stocks in full, naked and exposed with their margins, their PE numbers, their long-term earnings growth, their leverage everything in one sheet. You can filter it. I can see a few of you guys already in the sheet, uh, which is cool. So get your paws on that. It's completely free of charge. Part of our mission to make you better investors. That's really what it's all about. Now, free my boy. <laughs> oh, we've got Island Bill 69 with us. Oh, that's just lovely. Uh, just what the world needed. Uh, right. So, uh, let's uh, see if we got some questions here. Uh, Lulu Lemon is back, who we know is from Vancouver and wears only Lulu Lemon, of course. Let's see what we got in here. All right, guys, ask some questions. You want to look at the, the pre market? Pre market's looking pretty good. No one's believing the economic data. Everything is bouncing back in green. Tesla's still down a percentage point. Fat drugs are down a touch, but the rest of the market looking absolutely glorious. SoFi up another two and a half percent. That was a load of nonsense. That wasn't a... What about Palantir after a 9% up day yesterday? Another 4% up pre-market, which is just the party keeps on going, which is, of course, very nice to see, which is another high here at $27.12. Where did we top out in 2021? It was in the high 30s, wasn't it? It was even in the 40s at one point, but most of the trading was in the 30s. So we're now back to, yeah, sort of 2021, mid-2021 highs, which is pretty cool. And that high there could be a little bit of resistance. Not a lot, but 27.30 is kind of what we're looking at here. So yeah, you want to know something about one of your stocks? Ping it in the live chat. That's what we do this live for. Uh, Lululemon, I suspect you do. And Honey Badger, um, so far is being badgered. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think I, I think it makes a lot of sense. I bought some call options on SoFi. I, I might even buy some more leap options on SoFi. I haven't done that yet, but I was thinking about it. I, I just think people don't understand it. People kind of panicked. People are fairly irrational. There are a lot of retail investors in SoFi, so they get spooked more easily. It could also be that there was a lot of short interest on this, so they made a lot of money on it. We'll see. Let's have a look at what's the short volume thingy on this. Where did it go? Short volume. Are we allowed to know? There we go. Wow. Is that right? 39%? Seriously? Wow. Yeah. So that's that's shorts winning. That's what that is. But 
when you are at such crazy levels, 35% or something like that, then it also means on good news, you're going to squeeze up very, very, very violently, a uh, bit like we did here on earnings or here as well. We went from six to eight dollars. It's a pretty big move. Or we did it here in August. We went from nine to eleven fifty. So I think this is going to be super, super volatile from a fundamental point of view. I'm more with management than the market. They're, I think they're very competent. I think they're doing a good job. They've reduced debt load by doing what they just did with the convertible notes. And they've also given themselves some more money so they can loan out more money and make more money, which is kind of what a bank does. So I don't really get, it's a little bit dilutive, 7% or something at a, at a, at a, at a max, the stretch, but going down 15% on 7% dilution makes very little sense. What do you think about Honest, Simon? They got that very pretty founder, right? What's her name? The Honest Company. That's pretty much what I know about it. What's her name? Jessica Alba, that's the one. Um, there she is. Trying to look like one of the people. Um, but I don't really know much about it, to be honest with you. <laughs> to use the word honest. I don't really know why it tanked or why did any of that. I mean, earnings looked very good. Surprise profit. Market was expecting a loss. It's worth $300 million. What's the revenue on this thing? 90 million and a quarter. Okay. So valuation doesn't seem crazy, but they don't seem to be making much money, which is what I'd be looking into. So I would just like, honestly, look at their margins, look at their gross margins, look at like where they're heading, why they're growing, why they're not growing. And if you want to get into it, you honestly, you just have to listen to the earnings call. I know it's not the funnest thing to do in the world, but download it or something and play it while you're jogging or doing something or driving somewhere or something. And, and you'll get a much better impression than if you're just going by the pretty picture on the box, which is, you know, one of the reasons things done done quite well. Jay Khan says, let's get Felix some likes, guys. I appreciate that. Is Meta still considered cheap? I wouldn't go that far. I think it was last year when everybody hated it. But now at $500, we're back to, we're back to, well, we're at all-time highs. So we, you know, in 2021, it was at 382 at one point. It came down to 120 because nobody was using Meta except for the 3.1 billion people. Do you want to know something crazy? You want to know a crazy statistic? Let me give you a crazy statistic. Meta makes something like $210 per user, which is not bad. Netflix... We charge as a subscription because these are free users at, at, at Meta. Meta. Netflix makes how much? $190 per user, per paid user. So Meta is a pretty freaking amazing business, right? I mean, you, whether you like it or loathe it, it doesn't really matter. It's a, it's a great business. It just is. And people are using it. Three billion people are using it. Okay. Maybe a billion of those are bots, but still, a lot of people are using it. Um, Kitten the Orange Tabby had no idea she started her own company. Yeah, that's a, that's a big business. Honest company. Honest. <laughs> it's a great name as well, right? It's a really good name. It's a, it's a nice brand. But I don't really know how much they do. Uh, you think Sora is going to end all streaming services? I don't think so. I actually think Sora is going to make it how much money is Netflix spending a year on, on productions? Netflix production budget 2023. $13 billion and $17 billion in 2024. So if right now they are spending... Spend is $17 billion on... Difficult actors, actresses, producers, locations, staff, insurance, nightmare. 
if you can do half of that with AI, well, you save yourself $8.5 billion, which means what? It means the stock's going to go to the freaking moon because your margins go up. AI is the most beautiful thing to happen to somebody like Netflix because they can produce cheaper. They don't need to fly to the Fiji Islands to film that scene on the beach or something. No, they can just do it in freaking AI. And, and that's going to be great. They're going to be AI actresses. That You will have teenagers who will be in love with an AI actress. Yes, it's a weird, sad world, but that's just the reality and not that far removed from what it already is, I would say. Meta has subs now, it's true, but it's still a tiny percentage of their, of their revenue. Can you look at Pernod Ricard? Pernod Ricard is best looked at through a bottle. I... Where are they listed? Not in Paris? No. In Germany? Really? I don't know here. On Euronext Paris. That's where they're listed. Exactly. Um, yeah, I don't know much about... I mean, okay, I understand the business. I know the brands they have. Um, I, I used to be in majorly in, 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 in the alcohol business. But yeah, it's a bearish thing for sure. Earnings, I think we're disappointing... U.S. spirits exports rise. Tariff suspension. Okay, that might be the whiskey tariffs that the EU had on. But yeah, it's a it's a it's a falling knife though at this point. And, and you'd have to really look at is that something that's smart to own? I don't know. Is Alphabet a cheap stock? I think I put out a video yesterday. Where we talked about Google. I I like Google. I think Google is underrated at this point. I think that in the short term it isn't really going to go anywhere. I actually have a bearish trade open, although it's irritating that it's gone up 1% today, but it's still below the 200-day moving average line. If it closes above that, that purple line here, that's the 200-day, then that would be... May I have a pen? I'll just use this pen. Pen seems easier to use. There is the 200-day moving average line. Nothing good ever happens below it. That's sort of the golden rule. So you need to go up a fair bit before this becomes bullish again. But there is some support over here in this sort of, what's that, 132, 130 range. That's kind of our support zone here. And therefore, I don't think it's going to totally collapse. I think they have more data than anybody else. How do you win the AI game? Whoever has the most data basically wins the AI game. Google is in a pretty good position for that. You said of the bonds trade, says Tommy. No, no, we made money on that. We clo I, I closed out of that ages ago, um, the bonds trade. And I haven't put on a new one. I don't think it's as appealing right now because rate cuts expectations have come down a lot. So the 10-year yield, yeah, it's still below four, which is good. It's moving in the right direction again. But, you know, this is what we made money out of, the, the, the downward trend. This made money. This loses money. If you if you were in bonds, so you need to be in a place where you think it's going to significantly go down again, and I think it's a little early for that personally. Japan economy is a basket case, but it makes five companies a lot of money: Marubeni, Mitsubishi, Mitsui, Sumitomo. Who's the fifth? There's one more. The five trading houses, they, they make all the money. And the whole country is funded by its central bank, who, which owns like most things. Uh, so it's kind of a bit of a bit of a basket case. But I don't think it has a huge effect on the on the US market, to be honest with you. I'm going to hop off because I've got a call to take. I love you for tuning in. Get your hands on our benchmark free every single Nasdaq stock out there. Felix Frenzelorg slash Nasdaq. And I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thanks for tuning in.